Welcome. I'm Halcyon, and this is Hug Nation. Today I want to talk about my personal anti-racist journey, or my current epiphanies or lessons or aha moments as I have been doing the work, trying to understand white supremacy and trying to understand the racist systems that I've been a part of my whole life. Now, when I first kind of got swept up in the protests and the awareness and the articles and the speeches and, you know, clearly very late to the game, this is not a new movement, but as I got kind of pulled into and aware of the current state of frustration uh, after protests started in late May, um, I, I jumped in in the way that I often jump into things by thinking about how I can process this information and how maybe I can, can, can work through old beliefs, new beliefs, and kind of like make sense of them and then share them publicly. So a couple months ago, I was sharing a lot more frequently, a lot more raw, a lot of things that I hadn't thought through. And while a number of people really appreciated the perspectives I was sharing, also there were people that were very frustrated with me. And I received some criticism that was difficult for me. Part of that whole process of receiving that criticism was, was powerful for me to understand how much of my art, my expression, was dependent on and connected to the external responses I was getting. I think traditionally what I have done is try to stretch myself and go to vulnerable places and face things in myself and then turn it inside out if there's anything uncomfortable and make it public and, and share this vulnerability. And almost universally, I would get appreciation, compassion, and love in response. And so with regards to Black Lives Matter and anti-racism issues, the responses were not so universally positive. And because of the nature of uh, my privilege and my ignorance in terms of other people's perspectives and how that ignorance and, and lack of awareness has become so much more clear, that criticism stung in a way that past criticisms haven't because I, I really felt a responsibility to listen to those criticisms in a, in a deeper, more, more integrated way than I maybe have listened to criticism in the past. Because in the past, if you're criticizing something about my politics or my philosophy or my morality, I'm very confident in the way I stand in those places. And while I will listen to criticism, it doesn't, I don't, I don't prioritize anyone else's perspectives over mine. I might listen and see how it affects me, but I certainly wouldn't prioritize it. But in the realm of the black experience or women's experiences with earlier with Me Too things, I can't, I, I certainly have to prioritize other people's experiences. I cannot trust my own awareness and my own experiences. So that shift from a confidence in my own beliefs to a, a, a lack of foundation and an uncertainty, that in and of itself is destabilizing. And then to have the criticism hit at that time was a somewhat new experience for me. So I, I have slowed my roll a bit. I have, have slowed down the think, share, think, share kind of pattern that I've had in the past. And instead, think, write, don't upload. Think, write, talk in a small group. Think, think, talk amongst, you know, a discussion group I have or just hold it to myself and, and do a little bit more of this work personally. And 
recognize that these midway points of awareness is, are, are, are not to be tr to celebrated uh, publicly, perhaps, because they are midway. And in a midway journey, is still a far cry from where we need to be. So this whole shift in, in, in the way that I've done things uh, has been unsettling uh, and, and disorienting and because I have such a pattern of, of the way that I have responded to, to new awarenesses and, and, and growth in the past. But I totally understand that this is a different and unique thing because of the, the ingrained systems that I have been a part of so that I cannot even see or be aware of the things that I do not know and I'm not aware of. So I have been, um, I'm also aware that that process of, of doing the work and then being corrected and shut down and kind of uh, met with resistance is part of this work. And I am working on trying to keep stepping up, keep standing up after I get knocked down, keep standing up after I get knocked down and not be discouraged. Honestly, sometimes I am discouraged and I am, instead of frequently sharing my perspectives, I am trying to sit with them for a longer period of time, do more personal work and then share occasionally. But I'm, I'm, I want to avoid becoming silent and instead continue to speak occasionally and risk that pushback and criticism. I do recognize that my social media feeds are less inundated with Black Lives Matter news and protests and um, excitement and energy than they were. And that's a shame. So I am going to continue to keep checking in with my progress and my journey and, and what I am learning and growing. One of the things that I was uh, encouraged to do back when I stumbled in the past and made some mistakes and was to do reading, do workshops, and then share what you've learned. So today I wanted to share some of the things that I have learned as a white person going through my journey of learning about how to be an anti-racist and what those specific things that were more powerful in, in helping my head shift towards being a better person, being a better ally, being a better ancestor. So the first one is that racism isn't binary. The thought that there are racists and then there's the good people makes it so easy for me to feel like I'm one of the good people. Clearly, all I want to do is be a good person. I don't want to judge anybody. I don't want to hold anybody in a negative light simply because of skin color. That's insane. So therefore, I am not racist. I am a good person. And I am absolved of some of the responsibility. So learning that uh, racism is a, a state that infects an entire culture, legally, culturally, in the realms of entertainment and politics and finance, recognizing that you become aware that, oh, everybody in this system has been affected by racism. So even if I'm one of the good guys, I have things in me, things I've been impacted by beneath the surface, maybe overtly, or things that are becoming overt as I start to do work on them. And so that awareness that, oh, you can be doing the best you can, open-hearted, loving, kumbaya, and still have racism affect you, I think is so significant for a number of reasons. One, that then you recognize, oh, there's work for me to do. Two, it avoids the tendency to immediately become defensive and feel like I'm not racist, like I'm not on the, the binary negative. How dare you suggest that I'm part of the binary negative? However, if you say, are you on this spectrum of being affected in some way by this racist system? 
Oh, well, yeah, clearly, of course, of course. How could I not be? That gives us a place where we can have conversations and, and hear realities and not feel like, I, I didn't do that, that's not my fault. Go, oh, wow, that is part of the reality that I am a part of. What am I gonna do now? Another awareness that has been significant is making a distinction between being racist and being affected by racism. I made a video uh, at the beginning of a lot of this where I became aware that, oh gosh, I do have racism in me. I have been affected by racism. And so to try to, to publicly decrease the shame around that, that awareness, I made a video saying, I am racist. And a friend helped me to see the difference between saying I am racist and I have racism. It's kind of like the difference between saying I am poison and saying I have been walking through a field of poison ivy and even though I'm not itching myself, I have poison ivy and I am affecting people as I go through the world with this poison ivy. It's not who I am. It is a condition that I have received based on my, my past. And it is a condition that I can work to cure in myself. And in doing so, work to uh, push that healing uh, throughout the people that I meet. Or at least decrease the effect that I have on others by unknowingly passing on this poisonous condition. The third thing that has been a significant uh, kind of, oh wow, is that being colorblind is not the objective. As I grew up with extremely well-meaning parents, very liberal, um, very hippie-based in their philosophies, and social justice concepts and desires, there was this, this intention to be colorblind in the world, to not see color, to, to judge everyone based on not the color of their skin, but the content of their character. And what I have been learning as I am reading and studying is that that is a very problematic point of view. Because if you do not see color, then you do not provide a, a place to hear and understand how someone's experience could be drastically different based on their color. So when, if you are colorblind and someone explains to you their experience with the police, you're like, that's crazy, of course, why, no. Look, I don't see color, I, you are, no, that is not the way the world is. But if you can recognize, oh, you are a black man, I see that, so I can now be open to understanding how being a black man affects your interactions in every part of your life. There was a, uh, an essay written about uh, being a black man at Burning Man. And although they felt that they, they were embraced in incredibly powerful ways, they still were aware that even at Burning Man, they were a black man. And if you're colorblind, you hear that and say, oh, come on, that's in your head. If you see color, you go, okay, I, I recognize that you are having a different experience than me based on this difference. Help me understand. Tell me what, what you're experiencing so that we have a, a, a common reality, not a common experience, just a common reality for which to work to change, to, to work to be accommodating. The next thing that I read that was like, whoa, was the idea that Ebonics is its own language and not a bastardization of English. So 
that is such a significant idea. And I've heard that there are school uh, districts that are trying to, to, to integrate the idea of Ebonics as a second language or Ebonics being a first language and then English, you know, traditional English being a second language. If someone came from another country and they spoke Spanish or any language and they were in a classroom and their English was, was a little broken, you wouldn't have a judgment towards them. And yet, because of our cultural built-in racism, if someone grows up in a place, maybe may within this country, but it has a dialect that is uh, Ebonics, the, uh, I can't remember what else they call it, the urban something, um, there is a judgment towards that. And yet, there are brilliant minds doing brilliant work in the world that simply converse in this language. And so the, that kind of like snap in my head of like, oh, this is not someone speaking who is bad at speaking. This is someone speaking in their native tongue, which is just different. And for me, that was a big like snap. Oh, right. And I'm sure that I was affected by my youth and my schooling. And, and the way that, that it was spoken about in classrooms and otherwise. And so I, I'm just now getting my head around this idea that, that someone is potentially bilingual instead of uh, limited in their linguistic abilities. <laughs> Another thing that I've been chewing on is uh, the reality that um, I need to risk being wrong. And this is seems like so obvious and such a, a, a no-brainer, of course. Um, but I, I have really worked on trying to be kind of on the moral high ground in most of my life. And in this realm of ideas about racism and white supremacy, um, there is a lot of space to be wrong to somebody. There is no one stance where everyone goes, yay, you got it, correct. In fact, I would argue that we are living in a state of, of division in our country where that is true about everything. You cannot say something aloud in a public way and not have somebody criticize it. You can't even say the earth is a sphere. You can't even say, what a pretty moon. So, pff, you believe in the moon? So to, to, to step into these conversations about an evolving cultural understanding of race and racism and white supremacy is it's just it's it will result in backlash and 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 contrasting ideas and beliefs and, and frustration and maybe anger and so i am trying to get to a place where i just recognize that that is what will happen i imagine by any what i'm saying today someone will be rolling their eyes and frustrated with me about the things that I'm missing, uh, or the fact that I'm a white man talking about these things instead of uh, interviewing someone uh, who is has more to say and more experience. And that is something that I, by doing so, I am trying to work through the fear of someone being angry at me and recognizing someone will be angry at me. So, hopefully that's not you, but if you are, eh. That's your right. That's where we live. That's where we are. That's the only way that we move forward. So I guess the final point that has been uh, on my mind is that this is a long-term process of growth. That it took hundreds of years to get here, and it could take hundreds to get out of it, or through it, or heal from it. And that this is not something that we are going to fix before the election or 
in the next election or maybe in my lifetime. And I've had to really embrace that concept because otherwise I fall into hopelessness. Because as I'm trying to do the work and I'm trying to, to, to you know, work through the discomfort and work through the challenges, and then I see these examples out in the world and out in the news and in comment threads where I'm like, oh my God, like, I'm trying hard and it's tough for me. There's a ton of people who have zero motivation to even try. Like, how can we possibly get through this? And I find that to be pretty discouraging. Uh, kind of like, you know, if you are working to, to recycle everything and then you find out at the recycling plant that they don't actually recycle the stuff, you're like, what's the point? But if I hold on to the idea that we are on a journey and each step towards where we need to be is worthwhile. There was a sentiment in, a, in one of the books I've been reading where the goal is to be a good ancestor. And I think that is a very calming place to come to this work and not be overwhelmed by the, the, the magnitude of the, of the challenge and how ingrained some of these ideologies are. And instead, get encouraged that if we have a, a, a goal far in the distance, then every bit of work that we do now can have rippling effects for decades and decades and decades. So, periodically, I plan to check back in with more of these awarenesses and epiphanies and, and places of growth so that I can keep this conversation happening. Because it isn't something that just, you know, we have for a news cycle or an election cycle. This is a journey that personally and culturally, we are going to be on for a long time. So rather than speaking to it daily, I plan to periodically check in and remind myself and others of, of that we're midway on this journey. And that's okay. There's a couple uh, examples that have happened that I was going to discuss as well. Um, where I became aware of, oh yeah, I would not do that now with the awareness that I have now. Like when this happened, I thought I was colorblind and free of racism and acting from this place of full integrity. And based on my awareness at the time, I was. But now I see that it could be different. For example, There was a time, maybe six years ago, during the, the, the months leading up to Burning Man, I used to have brunches at my house for people who were in Pink Heart or wanting to join Pink Heart. We would get to know each other. We would sometimes build things and have meetings and have a brunch, and it was wonderful. And there was a, a gentleman who came, and he was kind of just breaking out of where he'd been in his past. I think he'd been in the military. And he had, was building friendships within the Tantra community and the Burning Man community. And he came to a brunch, came to a couple brunches. And I had uh, some people in camp, some women in camp approach me and said, you know, I don't really know this person. And he seems very touchy and very affectionate and overly, you know, familiar. And, you know, I understand that there's a lot of people in our group that have known each other for many years, and there is a lot of affection and a lot of touching between people that know each other, but it, it doesn't feel comfortable with this, this new person just assuming that they can get so uh, touchy with me. And it was, you know, more than one person that said it. Um, and so I confronted this person I pulled him aside. I said, "Hey, you know, I, I, I need you to know that you're making people uncomfortable, and you know that's not okay. So we need to figure out how we can uh, alleviate that and change your behavior or, or affect, you know, make. How do we make this go away?" And 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 he was 
defensive, frustrated, angry, as I imagine anybody would be being told these things. This is pre me too as well. And he said, this is only happening because I'm black. And me, as a person who is colorblind and who works so hard to be judge, non-judgmental and open and accepting, and Pink Heart is all about open, accepting, and love, and I was like, what? what? And I, you know, I thought to myself, ooh, that's not the answer I was hoping for. Like, the answer I was hoping for was, ooh, I'm sorry I made anybody feel uncomfortable. What can I do to avoid anyone feeling that way in the future? And if that's the answer, awesome, we can move forward. But that was not his response. And I felt so righteous in, in my stance that I kind of dismissed his, his race reasoning. And I think that if that would happen today, I hope that I would say, wow, can you help me understand this? Can you explain to me what is happening here or, or why you think that's happening? And what, what is, what, like, please help me understand your perspective in all this. Instead of me kind of settling into my, I'm right, I'm the leader, I'm making a decision and you need to listen to me and I know what's going on and it wasn't about race to be like, oh, whether it was or it isn't, like you feel like it is and I don't have the perspective to say that it's not. So I'm here to listen. And maybe in that place, we could have both let our defensiveness down and we could have found um, growth together. And that didn't happen. He demanded that we had a camp-wide kind of vote and it was ugly and he was kicked out of the camp before he ever camped with us. And I felt like I stood by my morality and my integrity and I felt good about it. But weighing that against where I see the world now, I do it differently. And hopefully these are the kind of things that doing our own work will help us to slowly grow and evolve and, and become better members of the human family and uh, less infected with the poison that we spread in the world. So I am, I am not feeling exceptionally secure in anything I've said. I'm feeling a little fearful of backlash. And I am recognizing that that place is part of my journey right now as a white person trying to process my past, my present, my ignorance, my learning, my discomfort, my judgment, and as I've always done, hopefully by making that process public, it plays some role in the helping others to articulate or understand or question or recognize aspects of their own journey that are parallel to mine. This sharing as a white man is a tiny part of the learning. And so hopefully this is just a augmentation to anything that you're doing as far as listening to people of color uh, and uh, uh, oppressed populations to to understand others perspectives and then integrate it to the one that you hold and hopefully grow that perspective from black and white to and binary and colorblind to one of super fucking complicated but within 
the the complications there's so much more nooks and crannies where we can work on ourselves and work on our world so i'm going to keep trying i i trust that you will too and know that i love you <laughs>